microbiological research, the morgue, pathology work, work with uh, genetically modified organisms. So, um, you know, I mean, and there's a lot, I, I didn't want to overbe the point about, you know, like the coronavirus, people have been saying that, you know, part of the release could have been through a lab in Wuhan. And, and so then you get the idea that it may be intentional work anyway. Right? At least that's one of the theories that is on, that is on, um, you know, um, you know, the conspiracy theories anyway. Right? So, um, spread can be through intentional work. Of course, the majority of it is actually um, through opportunistic work. Let me try to get that slide for you. Right, so most cases of biological infection occur incidental to work activities, such as food poisoning, uh, legionellosis as a result of inadequate disinfection procedures in water storage tanks, Hepatitis B as a result of an act of aggression by an infected person to a law enforcer, I guess enforcer, right? So I guess all, I guess all of this is saying that, um, you know, spread could be intentional or, you know, opportunistic and that it happens as a result of other activities anyway, right? In these cases, opportunistic infection occurs because the presence of the agent is less likely to have been identified or adequate control measures, um, you know, would have failed to be implemented. I think I clicked the wrong one there. Um, so in the event that infection is suspected, it will be necessary to identify the biological agent concerned. This may be achieved by sending a sample of the infected material to a diagnostic lab, which can grow the microorganism and identify it. Diagnostic tests can include microscopy obtained by CNN. Examples include um, this particular um, this particular disease. Then, right, is actually on the syllabus, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody knows what it stands for. Any ideas? No. <laughs> But it's quite long. Um, it stands for methicillin resistant streptococcus areas, right? It's, it's a very long game. It used to be on the syllabus, but it's on the syllabus. If you look for it, you wouldn't see it anymore, right? So the idea though is uh, I mean it's just one one example of that, that that I thought about that. If you had to know what you were dealing with, you have to identify it. So is it, you know, um MRSA or leptospira, whatever happened, right? And of course those not being involved, uh, you know, like Send the samples to the lab. Um, incubation period would be about 14 days. There are challenges of contamination, blood samples, or serological analysis, right? And again, these are a lot of medical terms. Um, not too much safety, but serological analysis involves things like looking at uh, the blood, looking at the, um, the glucose in it, the sores in it, the proteins in it. And of course, um, again, with the coronavirus, we can put things like antibodies from persons who may have been infected before. So all of that involves what is known as serological analysis, right? Um, so to me, no real questions there. They just have interest in law names of you know, diseases and um, you know some, some good medical terms there anyway. Um, so implementing risk control measures, decontamination and disinfection. Uh, so this one is just saying, sorry, so serum contains, I should have just kept on reading, right? Contains source glucose proteins, including antibodies. Serum from the blood of a person who has been infected with a microorganism usually contain antibodies that can protect other people from the organisms if injected into them. Such a preparation is called an anti-serum and it usually forms what is called passive immunization, right? So passive immunization, um, I guess we would have all had this. This is the, the injection we would, I guess we would have took, our parents would have given us anyway or carried us to the health center anyway. And um, they would normally need to be boost, which is why it's called passive. Passive means you are actually taking the antibodies from someone else and your body has been not produced that as yet, right? And if, I guess if your body would have produced it, that is called um, active humanization. Um, so where some of these labs are located, again, this slide would have been from the UK. So again, you have some ideas. I would have put in San Fernando, but again, that may not be true. It may actually be in um, uh, Kariri and whatever have you, right? So we have some there that is just information 
where um, where those labs would have been located anyway. Of course, you have a lot of private labs too, getting around Trinidad. Um, biological hazards, implementing risk control measures. The COSH regulation 2002 required the subsequent control of risk to help from substances where exposure cannot be eliminated. The philosophy encompasses the hierarchy of control, and we did mention um, something else last with the ACDP listed. Right? In the approved codes and practices to these regulations amended, um, which is 2006 anyway, the employer must now specifically consider a prescriptive approach, and that is what we would have mentioned um, many times in the course before that is the appendices to the first regulation, uh, Schedule 2A. And most of us know it, we would have. You know, we would have called it, um, and I think we have two names based on the course that you are doing, right? Here we have the principles of good practice, as it's also called the principles of prevention, you know, based on the level that you're looking at anyway, right? Um, so do I need to run through all of this, or you all have an idea of this? Is this the same idea of our elimination? Same thing we did, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, and so eliminate coming down all the way to PP. So I'll read the first one, I'll read maybe one in the middle and one in the end, right? But, um, Read. I know he's not on as yet. He did a question for me. I was just correcting it there. Um, it didn't put a year on it anyway, right? But it was it was a question I asked. Um, you know, using the the principles of good practice, so the principles of prevention, um, to discuss how we'd have you know uh, control um, and the question here. How we'd have control. Um, Carcinogens, right? So, uh, carcinogens in the work is a 10 mark question. So, sometimes if you don't know this, it's a good idea to learn this by heart, right? Um, I think the understanding is easy, which is to, you know, basically try to eliminate at first, right? Um, take into account all relevant routes of exposure, control exposure by means and then proportionate to the risk. And as you go down, you would see, you know, um, the end of it anyway. Right, coming to the end of it, you find things like information, training, and then PPE and stuff, right? PPE is E here, right? Um, so you could utilize this if you don't know it as yet um, to have an idea of it to use on um, questions going forward anyway. I think I mentioned last week though that um, in terms of this course, most of the controls is on engineering controls, right? Which may still fall on this slide before which is um, control appro uh, uh, appropriate or proportional to the uh, level of risk, right? So you'll find um, a lot of engineering controls on, um, on it. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you all had a chance to read it when the biological safety cabinets, that I think is the most um, interesting part of it, thus far, the new part of it, when you think about the control hierarchy. Any questions there? I just want to see if you're still in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, um, so in terms of biological agents, the assessment control strategy should be along the following lines. Primary assessment of health risk to workers, establishing whether exposure cannot be eliminated. And of course, I mean, this, the, the, the line says that this is especially to health risk or healthcare workers then, right? Where the risk cannot be eliminated. Exposure to be prevented, minimized by substitution of a less hazardous agent, if that is possible, and that's typically for intentional, like intentional work, perhaps I guess in a lab per se, right? Introduction and testing of control measures, in informing employees of hazards associated at work, records kept of employees exposed to biological agents in hazard group three and four. And I think we mentioned that last year, that was the ACDP listed anyway. Three and four would, of course, been those that does have a treatment or a cure, right? Um, so notification to the agency of first use of biological agents and hazard group two, three, and four, intentional work, of course. Um, notification to the agency of consignment or import of biological agents and hazard group four, and some in group three, monitoring of employee exposed introduction of health surveillance where relevant. Um, the objective of implementing and maintaining control measures are to prevent or minimize the escape of the biological agent, uh, to prevent or minimize the risk of illnesses caused by exposure to biological agents, 
if they do escape. The principle of control is based on a series of barriers which serve to isolate the agent from the person at risk. Confinement may be by primary barriers, secondary barriers, and tertiary barriers. And again, you know, I mean, we actually do hear a lot of this like in the news, you know, um, it's almost like phase one, phase two, and phase three anyway. It's the same concept, right? So, um, I mean, again, I wish I could just explain these things, but for the sake of um, reading, because I know, like I said, there are some person that might not have gone to this slide. And of course, if I explain, we'll finish in a very short time. So I'll stick with the lesson and you can read. But um, what they're saying here, I'll just explain this piece that what they're saying here is that in terms of implementing controls, you want to do isolation, like what we see in, I guess, all over the world. But the isolation could be classed as primary barriers, secondary barriers, and tertiary barriers. And um, not to jump ahead of myself, but Again, based on time and everything as well, when you look at the biological safety cabinets, those at the end of the slide, those can more fall within, like for example, secondary barriers. And of course, the more sophisticated cabinets, those like with the double HEPA filters, can be classed as tertiary barrier measures anyway, right? So what you need to kind of distinguish here is that um, primary barriers then, uh, and secondary barriers and tertiary barriers may include engineering controls like the biological safety cabinets, right? The primary barriers, in fact, might not. The primary barriers may just involve, you know, like um, uh, keeping unauthorized persons away. Let me see if I can find it for this slide for you. Um, so primary barriers uh, can just be a the hazard to prevent escape of the agent into the environment. Physical containment can probably mean, you know, like isolating the area. GLPD are uh, following good lab practices, and that is so refined. Uh, I would have mentioned some last week. Uh, that may include, and there's so much there, there's a few on this slide, but we might get to it today. It may include things like at the end of uh, the work with the biological nature, the lab technicians are to dispose of their coverall, etc. Right? It may involve things like uh, simple things like you know washing your hands with warm water and soap, um, using some sort of um, disinfectant, right? Um, wearing the face mask, etc. Right. So especially design equipment, and of course, um, I do have some UK type examples here: uh, a washable hygienic mm -hmm. keyboard and mouse. So if someone, you know, those technicians at the lab using this next star biological agent, for example, for analysis or computer analysis. Right at the end of the day, then it's capable of the at the same time, right? Yeah, so secondary barriers to protect the worker by providing an awareness of the hazard, medical supervision, personal protective equipment, washing and hygiene facilities. So you get the idea that um, there are different levels of isolation, kind of like what the world is under. So primary and secondary, then tertiary, right? And um, um, I'm trying to see, but I mean, there is, there is a passive on this. Um, I did send a worksheet this week, but it wasn't that one. But there is a passive on this that, that I mentioned it last year that went into something like um, like about 10 of those physical controls, but really down to earth controls like, you know, um, wiping the surfaces with an alcohol based product, making sure it's impervious to spills and stuff like that. So there is one like that, but I didn't get it. I suppose if anybody look and you find it, you can let me know. And I'll probably um, you know, do a scan of it and put it up as well. Right? Um, so tertiary barriers are um, around the premises to prevent access. Sorry, around the premises, and this may be like a, a lock and key, a security kind of entry thing. Access, you know, only to authorized person. Escape of solids, liquids, and gaseous waste and effluents can be prevented now. Um, and again, I mean, I'll just mention it now, but a lot of ways this can be prevented is by the use of the biological safety cabinets, right? I mean, if it was in class, I would have just gone to that and I'll show you what I was talking about. But um, but but that is what they are talking about. So like the HEPA filters that is able to filter the incoming air and another HEPA filter able to filter it as it goes back maybe to some collecting, um, you know, dog for safe. Um, that is how they'll prevent, you know, the escape of solids. And uh, well, solid or really more or less education states anyway of those of those agents. 
right? Um, I'm seeing Kishan, I mean, let's add Kishan in. So, um, biological hazard implementing risk control measures, the specific control measures employed for wood with biological agents can be categorized and prioritized in the same manner as encountered within general control strategies, like example, the hierarchy of control. In this case, considering, and we have all been saying this, elimination, which is now interpreted to be eradication. And um, they went on to give some examples. Yes, a number of labs have replaced biological materials with IT simulations. For, I guess, training technicians. Uh, we did cover something like this when we looked at um, a lesson on um, uh, the AIMS test. The AIMS test was in that lesson as well as um, something called QSA, right? uh, which would have been computer modeling of, an, of a chemical to see what it was anyway. Right? Um, so these are just examples of eradication, so a lot of people one. Um, Bear in mind, well, I mean, I think we all have an idea of this, and this is once you start in control or think about control, you want to go along the idea of the control hierarchy. But again, because it is um, biological agents, we have to talk that way, right? Like, for example, instead of saying elimination, you say eradication. Instead of saying substitution, you say reduce um, uh, virulence. It may be possible to substitute the hazard for an agent that presents a lower risk, right? Um, so I guess this is more lab work anyway. Reduce very, uh, very large is an idea of substitution. And again, that's what they did with the AIMS test. They would have took the salmonella bacteria, and, you know, um, weaken it a bit, heat it and add chemical stick. And they would have been able to grow that to identify if an agent would have been a carcinogen or not a carcinogen. I don't even remember that lesson, but if the agent was able to cause the bacteria to attack the brew, it meant it was a carcinogen. So you can probably have a look back at that anyway. But as an idea of you know, using something, I mean, a bacteria, as, as bad as they are, isn't as bad as a virus. Remember we mentioned last week that bacteria, I mean, they actually do have cures for those, but if you look today, they are new cure for viruses. It may be safer to use a bacteria to study, for example, what they do with the AIMS test and what they do to decide what a carcinogen is as opposed to using a virus. So bear in mind, this one is substitute, but it's virulence, um, is what you have to say. The risk of working with biological materials in labs can be reduced by measures, or by, by, by measures such as screening human specimens of blood-borne virus infections and using heat treatment to reduce the number of potentially hazard, hazardous organisms present. Um, there's a nice one, change of work method, uh, include aerosol suppression. And this is just a simple example. This is if you have uh, the agent in a test tube, just to put like a cotton wool bomb. A bomb is the, it's just like the cork onto the test tube anyway. And that will prevent aerosol suppression, right? So that's a simple way. Um, so this will prevent the media being contaminated from external organisms and reduce the risk of the quality of common and aerosol. Right, so all of this is uh, examples of change in the work method. Isolation and segregation. In the context of biological agent, the aim is for the biohazard to be segregated from less hazardous work. So only those work require, uh, only those work require them to potentially come into contact could be exposed. In the case of infected animals and hospitals, infected persons may need to be isolated from others to reduce the risk of, of, the, inspect, of the infection spreading. So we have isolation wards, and again, typical to what's in the world today, quarantine arrangements as well. Um, so I'm afraid though it's probably going to get good just at the end of the lesson, which is containment. Um, so containment, engineering control principles are similar to those adopted for chemical agents. Um, containment, passion, and closure. And if you remember, of course, engineering controls like the LED and general exhaust ventilation. But of course, we mentioned last week that this does involve the biological safety cabinets, right? So I would just summarize this piece here. All of this is a result of caution. We went through this last week. Caution didn't mention that you need to consider um, containment based on, the, uh, based on the work of the advisory committee for dangerous pathogens. And that's the committee that 
class, I mean, to the four groups, right? One, two, three, and four. Three and four being those that, that don't have a cure or a cure treatment. Or treatment. Yeah, all right? Um, so, um, just about 10 minutes again, right? Suitable, it's a CL1. Um, so this is types of containment. And I just wanna kinda of clarify this, right? Um, the types of containment is not the type of cabinets, right? Uh, it's kind of written a bit funny on the slides, right? So this is just um, a containment, a containment me me um, um, measure. I've just seen on Zoom here. We have okay, it's unlimited. Right, okay, good. But I was trying to, uh, a long story short, I'll talk about that, I guess, after the recording, right? I was trying to, to do something yesterday with it, and um, it wasn't happening. Tried about five times, so yes, I'll try it today again anyway. Right? Um, right, so I was saying in terms of um, containment, just be careful with the head and this slide. This is saying um, this is implementing risk control measures, right? So this containment is a measure, it's not the containment, then in other words, it's not the cabinet, right? Uh, so CL1 measure may involve a cabinet. Right? a biological safety cabinet, right? A CL2 measure may involve, and of course, if you look at the side, it's actually not so, but it's really CL3 and CL4 containment measures that involve the biological safety cabinets. If you look at this slide, this slide has it really well. CL3 measures may involve separating the work, right, from other activities in the building. For example, if you're doing lab work, then the lab must be separated from yeah, separate the other parts of the building, right? So just make sure you understand that you don't confuse because, uh, well, we're not getting to, into the cabinets today, I guess. But when you look at the cabinets, the cabinets also are four, like, like one, two, three, four. Just know that they are containment measures, CL1, CL2, CL3, CL4. And the measures may involve a cabinet anyway, right? So CL3 can often almost guess that, like, I guess the three are the forward line of that CL3 measures containment uh, measure three will actually line up with saying that yes that does involve some kind of biological containment or a biological con uh, cabinet maybe like a cabinet two three or four right so we'll see it here uh this will be the last line cl3 measures or containment measures may involve work would normally be carried out in a, in a biological safety Okay. Cabinet, and again, when you look at them, you want to really talk about cabinet three and four because those are the ones that will fall within the more, you know, um, high risk biological agents anyway, right? So I guess I'll read this one. I won't go back because this is where it gets good anyway. So labs are uh, maximum containment facilities. Entry through an airlock. Input and extracted air must be filtered, and and um, again, that's really have filters will carry out in close negative pressure safety cabinets, right? Um, so I'll kind of try to wrap this one up here. Um, uh, if you don't know what negative pressure is, right? Negative pressure is um, pressure that creates um, a vacuum, right? In, uh, for example, a fan, I have a fan to the back of me there. A fan gives out well, air then, right? It actually circulates the air, that it creates you know, like a force and pushes the air forward, right? So that's called positive pressure, right? Negative pressure systems. Now remember, in a lab or in, let's say, uh, the cabinets, the biological safety cabinets, that is, that is inside of one of these labs here, CL4 type base lab, you wouldn't want anything leaking out of the cabinet and then out of the room and into the other room. So. What it says is that you have a negative pressure. Negative pressure means it creates. Um, Want to use it with a suction, but it, it could be like a like like a like an air curtain, meaning that the air flows in a certain way, uh, a certain force. Then it, it, it goes. If I have one, if I have my um, if I can get the annotation thing here to come up, all right. But um, it, it flows then in a certain. Um, way that it creates you know like a curtain just like that so that none goes out of it then right it just goes up and comes back down kind of like what we call a light curtain if you did uh, you know radiation and lasers and stuff but it does that right so that's a negative pressure so that none could escape 
to the outside, right? It forms that almost like an invisible barrier here so that whatever is in the cabinet, whatever is in the containment stays within that particular containment, right? So that's a nice point to remember for exam. Um, you know, uh, you know, create a negative pressure within those labs there, right? And of course, the cabinets have a negative pressure as well. But if the cabinet is in a lab, then the lab itself, you know, should be kept under a negative pressure. So that nothing seeps under the doorways, nothing seeps, you know, out of any vent per se, right? But there is that air there, that air stream that circulates there and it creates that air curtain to keep whatever you have inside there anyway. Right? Um, so I think this so I would um, I would stop the recording just about here, right? Um, the reason is that we do have other classes coming up. I have one. We'll start a little bit later on today, right? But next week I'm gonna have some that's gonna start around 11 o'clock for some other um, classes anyway, right? So I'll stop here. So based on what I'm looking at here, it would seem as if um, we should be able to finish off this next week. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, let me just um, take a look. I don't know. I like said I know it's just so you can find my participants, right? Um, so I know Farid is there. I want to mark the role in a bit, but I'll come off the recorder for that, right? Um, so I'm seeing seven, right? Um, so I, I did um, I did send you all some homework. So I don't know if anybody had a look at it. I'll just bring it up now. Um, everybody got this email. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Right. I don't know if um, but the reason for sending it before was to give me a chance to have a um a go at it before um you know like I said for the very first time um in the class session itself, right? So again, we don't have to answer all of it, but I just want to read through it a bit, right? Um, Right, so I didn't put a year. I don't know if you want to go back and look at that. I didn't put a year. So they said norovirus is a common cause of gastroenteritis that can spread rapidly in closed communities such as hospitals, care homes, and cruise ships. Explain how the virus is transmitted. Three marks. Identify the symptoms of norovirus. Outline how the spread of the virus can be minimized. Any ideas? So, well, I attempted it. Right. Let me see. So, um, yeah, give us so one answer, I guess, you know, because. Um, right. Yeah. So, the virus, what I had, could be transmitted through, I don't know if it's correct, pure hygiene, yeah. transmitted through fecal matter. Right. Um, contaminated food by flies, and if you didn't wash your hands. Yeah. Right. Um, anyone else? Um, I think um, one of the things they mentioned with this one is that um, they said that the virus could survive outside of a living organism, like it, it could survive on surfaces. Um, you know, um, so in particular, they made mention of um, the droplets, or should I say the aerosol, if that's the word to use there. Remember, gastroenteritis is normally, um, I know the symptoms is partly, but it's normally, you know, like vomiting and diarrhea and stuff. So, you know, like the droplets from that, they said, you know, like from vomit and whatever, on a surface, um, could be transmitted to another person as well. So you can look that up a bit. Um, I'll just talk about part C here, outline how the spread of the virus can be transmitted. And um, when I looked at this, I mean, remember for those who know me a bit, um, I love just to tie these things back into the question. And the thing that I would have noticed in this, well, it is outlined, so that's obvious. It's four maps, but what makes it easy for me is that the question has three settings, and I don't know if you saw that. If you, if you read the question, it actually has three settings in the question. 
Yeah, they can literally give how to reduce the spread of the hospital. And that's going to be totally different to a cruise ship. You understand that? So, right. so if they just think of it as the hospital alone, you know, you may come up with two one and you're trying to, you know, rack your brains or was that third one or was the fourth one? But the thing is, they give you three aspects to the question then. So then, how could you um, minimize the spread of the hospital? Care homes and cruise ships, right? So cruise ships is just out of the box there. So that'll give you some fresh new answers anyway, right? No, I, I do okay. have one, so I want to share one with you. One that me watch, I saw they had was, um, so when I first saw it, I was like, what are they talking about? But then, then, then I, when I read the question, I saw they mentioned cruise ships here. Um, I think they mentioned um, avoid eating, you know, like raw fish. You know, um, right? So like sushi, so sushi and stuff. Right. Yeah, and you'll find that a lot, you know, like in the gourmet section of a cruise ship to see that, right? So like, if maybe um, that virus, gastroenteritis, which is actually a viral disease as well, is suspected. Uh, you know, someone and they, someone and staff had it on the cruise ship, but then you know, avoid you know that sort of foods anyway. So it's such a nice person, but again, that's where the beauty of um, I guess breaking down a question lies. If you can read the question and see that, to me, it makes it fun to see that you could simply get way much more than four countries there because they did give you a range of locations to talk about the hospital, the care home, and the cruise ship. Right, um, so what I'll do, I want to stop the recording. I didn't do it as yet. I want to, I just put one pass in, but I, I will do the other one. I think we didn't mention that one. Um, they do have, um, again, zoonosis there, but the type that they mentioned is um, cytokosis, right? I know that um, Diane, I'm not sure if Diane is online there, but I know that's one of her favorite questions as well, right? That is actually a repeat question. Um, had be here, right? Set of process and what it is and how is it, you know, um, transmitted and stuff, right? So, I'm still trying to drop off. Uh, it, it comes and it goes on, on this on this software anyway, right? So there it is. So, right. So I'm gonna end the recording.